everybody, and welcome to First Indiana Robotics' History of Game Design webcast. This is session three of five, where we're going to talk about uh, games from the year 2009 all the way through 2012 in the first robotics competition. My name is Nick, and joining me is Liz Smith. Hi, my name is Liz, and I work for Andy Mark as an applications engineer. I'm an alumna from a team in New Jersey, and I'm a mentor on the Cybertooth Robotics team. Awesome. And also joining us, we have two FIRST alumni, uh, some of my favorite strategists that I know in FIRST. We have Katie Wyden and Peyton Young um, joining us here on the call today. Katie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Katie. Um, I'm from Wisconsin. I used to be on 1675. Uh, when I graduated, I moved to Iowa and helped start 3928 Team Neutrino. And then I moved to Texas where I joined 1296 uh, Full Metal Jackets. And then most recently, I moved to California, and now I'm part of 253 The Boba Bots. Awesome. And Peyton, good to see you as well. Tell us a little about yourself. Hi, I'm Peyton. Uh, I'm a mentor for Team 461 here in Indiana, and I'm actually an alumni of Team 45 out of Kokomo, Indiana. Awesome. Uh, again, thank you guys for taking the time out of uh, your busy lives to be a part of this broadcast. Um, it's uh, really great to see uh, more FIRST alumni involved in projects like this, for sure. So today's session, as I said, is going to cover uh, FIRST Robotics Competition games between 2009 and 2012. Um, I like to call these games like the last games of the beginning of the modern era, era where we moved to 3v3, and it's kind of like the refinement of that. But the key here is these are the last few games where a mostly external game design committee uh, worked on creating and designing these games. Right around the end of the session is where we switched into a mostly internal uh, committee of made up mostly of first engineering staff. Um, so we start to see a, a few interesting things appear right at the end of this era and moving forwards from here. But almost all of us were uh, uh, either students or mentors during this period, so we all have firsthand experience uh, with playing these games. They're, they're a lot of fun. Um, I'm really excited for this session. There's um, a lot going on. That's why this session is, is a bit smaller because we're doing a, a kind of a really deep dive on these four specific games. Um, the newer the games, the more that there is to unpack. So um, the earlier sessions like session one and two um, have a lot more like individual games, but we're spending a bit more time on the more recent games because they're a lot more complex. So with that, uh, let's jump straight in. Let's take a look at 2009 and Lunacy. Katie, how did, how did this game get played? Okay, so I always describe Lunacy as robot tag. So the way the game worked is every single robot had a trailer attached to the back of them. And the goal was to get uh, orbit balls, which are the funny little banded balls in the front of your video, uh, into the trailers that your opponents are carrying. So it's very much like playing tag in a way. Um, very straightforward concept, but every team had to use the same hard plastic wheel and the game was played on a hard plastic flooring, which created a very low traction circumstance. And so not only was the game a game of chasing other robots down, collecting these, these very kind of strange balls, um, but then it was also managing your limited traction while doing all of that. So if you tried to drive too fast, you would just spin your wheels out. Uh, if you tried to stop too fast, you would just kind of slide. Um, and also pinning that year was legal, so that created some really interesting like strategy. Yeah, definitely. Um, I like to think of this game as kind of like upending for a little while the drivetrain wars that were occurring in the first robotics competition at that time, because the previous game that we cover in session two is 2008, Overdrive, where a lot of it was drivetrain based. You were like racing around the field and trying to optimize your drivetrain. That got totally flipped on its head, and now you have no traction whatsoever um, when, when playing this game. Y yeah, um, and by like limiting the wheels, you really... Uh, teams were pretty much stuck with like doing a six wheel or a four wheel or the like two teams who decided to try making a, a swerve drive. Right, definitely. And and Peyton, all of the game pieces were relatively the same like shape or size, but there were there were different special game pieces and some uh, dynamics around those. Yeah, it's uh, especially interesting. So each of the game pieces were, like you said, about the same, but they had different colors. And then I think one of the more interesting facets about that is there's a game piece that doesn't count for any points if scored in a trailer, but it has a special uh, use in the end game, which is a, an interesting dynamic of uh, having a robot have to deliver a specific game piece from one portion of the field to the other portion of the field and exchange it for something of an immense 
point value being 15 points for a supercell. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting dynamic where there's not really a true end game, but the end game is more, can you make this task of swapping game pieces around and then uh, whether you're a good human player or not, uh, getting that in someone's trailer. This, this game is is interesting. Um, we in talking about the trailer a little bit more. Um, there's a there's an interesting thing. This this trailer, the thing that all the robots had to pull, was built similarly to some of the older goals we saw in older first games, like the 2004 goal, where it's a bunch of vertical, uh, hollow, round plastic pipes um, that end up making the volume of the goal. Yeah, there were a lot of hexagons, a lot of PVC pipes that were kind of used consistently in those previous games. Um, but one of the, I think the most interesting aspects is that it was actually attached to the robots. So you actually had to attach a field element to yourself uh, in order to participate in this challenge. Uh, Katie, what do you think about that? Yeah, I don't remember my team installing a trailer hitch, but that definitely was a requirement was having that hitch in the right spot. And if I recall correctly, it was also, it had to be attached behind you um, and so if you didn't have the ability to plan for having this attached to you, uh, practicing that year was really hard, and that was one of the decisions the committee made that's interesting, is because of the surface and these goals, if you didn't have, like, it was very hard to practice at home. Um, so if you hadn't planned for the additional weight of that trailer, you could run into issues with your drivetrain. Uh, yeah, definitely. I know, um, my team just... We didn't think super critically about the drivetrain so much and just like, oh, whatever, wide six wheel drive, it's fine with a little bit of a rock. Well, that was not the answer whatsoever for that game. Um, and the robot drove fine by itself, but as soon as there was a trailer on it, we realized we were in trouble and we actually like hacked apart our center wheel um, and left the hub in place and turned it into a four wheel drive like mid season because mm -hmm. we struggled to drive. I know after, um, especially on the floor, you know, one of the, I think crazy things that I remember when when seeing the kickoff broadcast was that there was really nothing on the field at all. It was just blank, and that to me was kind of kind of strange. Um, but then also, I know a lot of teams realized that um, the surface, the plastic surface that covered the floor, um, didn't actually cover the whole surface. There were some edges of the carpet yeah. that were um, were sticking out. Um, Katie, do you remember about that and kind of what that meant? Yeah, so there are about six inches-ish of carpet that was running along the perimeter of the field, which meant that if you were running along the perimeter, you had more traction on that one corner On the if you're driving on the edge. Um, so you'd find teams who'd want to go towards that because you could get a little bit faster, uh, but that also puts you in a really vulnerable spot to be pinned. I remember one match, we were against uh, Symbotics, and they just got shut down the whole match because they just got pinned in a corner. And I think part of it is that because they were trying to ride along that edge, you know, to get that speed, because you would go faster. The the wide open field and like A, the fact that it's wide open, but B, the the surface really actually drove a lot of weird robot design stuff. Um, right around the championship, we started to see um, like fans start to show up on a lot of robots uh, yeah. to try to get more forward propulsion. Uh, Peyton, you were on a team that actually had a massive fan um, on the back of a robot. Yeah, so the, the team that I was part of in high school, Team 45, had this giant propeller on the back of their robot. I think it, they said it came from an ultralight airplane. So it was fairly massive. And I, based on what I heard from some of the mentors that were like very involved with that portion, uh, the initial intent was partially to see if they could blow moon rocks away from the trailer off the back. Uh, and obviously that didn't work as well, but they found that it did provide a little bit of additional oomph while driving around that uh, gave them a slight advantage. And I think it, overall it worked well for them because the additional ability to drive around a, a field, especially on a field that nobody's dri driven before on, uh, can be incredibly advantageous, especially at early events. Uh, the amount of grip and traction that you had as the surface A got dirty from both people traffic and just general robot debris, but also the wear that would happen from all of these wheels, like continuously spinning and grinding it down. You would have a very different level of, uh, grip isn't the right word, traction's the right word here, from like your first practice match at a regional all the way to like finals match two. There's a really big difference. Katie, do you, do you remember that? Yeah, I also remember there was a Q&A about how dirty your wheels could be. 
um, because teams realize that if I have this pristine, slick, perfect wheel, it's not competitive. Um, and so I remember that became a thing of how rough can your wheels get before they are considered modified? Yeah, there were, like, the, the rules were written around those wheels that they were supposed to be like somewhat sacred, but the text was kind of loose around that. I remember that as well. So one of the other aspects, I think, of 2009 that um, is, is somewhat important is that this is actually the first year of a new control system as well. Mm -hmm. So this is the year that uh, was switched over to you know, a Wi-Fi-based control system. Um, so there was a, a pretty steep learning curve for teams. Katie, you were on a team then. Do you happen to remember some of, some of those aspects? Yeah, I remember there were a lot of uncertainties because we were working out this new control system. And then... On top of that, um, I don't remember if it's true or not, teams were believing that the wheel, like the plastic on plastic interaction of the robots on the floor was creating static issues. And so you're having teams running into these control issues that it was hard to pin down if it was based on static because it only happened at some events or if it was based on this new control system. Um, and it wasn't, it was, you know, rev one of the modern NI system. Um, back then we didn't have a laptop. We had a little blue box and you had to be really careful uh, my team destroyed one of our ports because you would plug your, your internet port in and we destroyed one because uh, those boxes probably weren't made for the abuse that high schoolers will give to any product you give them. It was also the first year that you could program not only in C. And so that was another thing is that it opened up programming capabilities. Yeah, um, I was a volunteer in those years and static was a huge problem. Um, I remember you know, just as like a, a field volunteer, you would walk up to the side of the field and touch the metal side border and like have to hesitate because you knew it was going to hurt when you when you went and touched it. Um, because that you're right, the, the plastic wheel on the plastic floor would just generate so much static um, and then it would discharge on any any other metal grounded surface that it came across like a field border attached to the carpet on the side of the field or um, you know, that happened to be attached to your metal driver station that was at the at the driver station gate. Right. Um, one, of, one of the things that we take for granted now uh, in modern games is the color of the bumpers on robots mm -hmm. signifies which alliance it's on. But Peyton, this is actually the first time we saw bumper colors being utilized as the as the signifier, right? It was on the trailers. That year, every trailer for one alliance was one color and had a special vision target uh, with a light blue or light pink and green color and then reversed for the other alliance. That was what took over for the, the old robot flags that used to designate alliances. And in regards to the bumpers on the robot, uh, that was a mandated robot bumper, uh, but that did not have any specific color. So it's really great seeing some really clever or interesting uh, colors of bumpers that teams had to kind of personalize their robot. So to add on that, I know for, um, I was always played in the bumper era, but for those who had played before the bumper era, they hated bumpers. But I love bumpers for two reasons. A, mounting flags was a pain uh, because you had to find a good spot for it and it had to be accessible and your flag, didn't, your flag couldn't fall out because uh, we had flags in 2008. And then two, Bumpers made identifying robots infinitely easier. If nothing else, you knew the robot with wild with tie dye bumpers was wild staying. So for every like everyone that hates bumpers, uh, I thought they were great because I loved the creativity of bumpers of seeing how teams would pick the colors and how they like decide to put their numbers. Um, I loved not having flags. I liked that it was really obvious what team was what color. Yeah, it definitely makes and, it a lot easier to watch, right? Like yeah, it makes it a lot more spectator friendly for somebody walking in off the street, right? Well, and as a scout, too, because you don't have to guess who's red and who's blue or squint to find that piece of paper on the side of the robot that says what number they are. Exactly. So one thing that was interesting about this game is there was no specific point advantage for scoring game pieces in Autonomous. And you basically had two choices, or actually three real choices. Right, Peyton? Yeah, so based on what I've seen for most of the Autonomous modes, it's kind of a... Uh, ordered chaos to if you if you think about it. Uh, so a lot of teams had the standard move away from the wall because generally where you started was right in front of your opposing alliances human players who were probably some of the biggest scorers of every match. Uh, and then there was a lot of uh, robots that could move into a position to receive balls from their own human player. 
And then uh, another option I've seen was there was a couple of robots that were very good at moving around the field uh, autonomously and finding other trailers to score on uh, using those vision targets. I think uh, 2056 comes to mind for uh, robots that were just very good at finding this vision target and being able to adjust everything to score completely autonomously on a moving goal. Right. And, and Did I Katie, answer the three different things? <laughs> yes, that is it. Okay. Um, and, and Katie, I, I, I imagine you remember some of the chicken that would start to happen at higher levels of play with like two teams that were trying to figure out which pathway they were going to go to load at their corners, right? Well, yeah. So as he was saying, I was like, I remember I loved the chess mass match of it. Um, so I was on the drive team. And so one of the things we did before the match started was like pick our auto. Um, and it was a lot of fun of like, okay, I think the, so far on the red alliance, it's like, okay, I think the blue lines person directly opposite of us is going to go straight. Do we want to go straight to counter them? Or do we want to go off to the side to like mess up their, like you had to, it was a chess match. And I thought that was really fun. And it did become a game of like, where are they going to go? And are they going to try to attack me? Are they trying to load? And how can I block or counter that? And then I just, I brought to point out the vision targets. So everyone now is used to these retroreflective targets, which are really great because it means only your robot can see it when your robot's looking for it. Um, and I remember the arguments on the internet about the pink and green because they're saying, well, what if pink team is above Mo in the stands? Is my robot going to try to aim at that? And as always, someone had to bring grandma into it. They're like, well, what if grandma decided to wear a green shirt with pink pants? Because you know grandma would. And so it's just funny to me when I look back at the old vision targets and how people were so concerned about these false positives that have all been eliminated by like the modern stuff of either IR lights or the ref reflective tape. Yeah, I think one of the interesting facets about auto for Lunacy is it's one of the last few games uh, we've ever had where there's interaction directly between your alliance and the opposing alliance. And generally, uh, most people nowadays notice that there's usually some delineating factor of the field which prevents you from interacting. So it's it's a, from a strategic point of view, being able to handle a whole mess of things that can come your way that you never planned for is really impressive for some of these older teams. Especially with a new control system all at the same time of having to <laughs> write these, you know, these complex autonomous yeah. strategies with a brand new control system, right? Mm -hmm. I remember remember all the auto planning of like, I assume a lot of teams had like at least 15 different autonomous runs that they never ran because they wrote them because it was just, I don't know, basically bang, bang control of, oh, run these motors for a while, run these motors for a while and hope for the best because good luck sensing anything. Right. Um, and there were basically like unlimited possibilities of yeah. where you could go or end up on, on the field, right? Yeah, I remember a, a, a placement battle that happened I don't remember which division. I think it might have been Curie or something. Um, whichever division the, the Thunder Chickens were in, where in the finals, they there was no placement rule of who had to place uh, first or last. It was just missing from the manual. And there was this like 15-minute standoff between the two alliances because to them, placement mattered. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. I remember that 100% because I remember in the following years, um, either someone would be like, why are there rules about who places first? And I'm like, because one time it was a huge deal. Which I'm actually surprised that after like 2006 they didn't figure that out. Because I feel like it was a similar thing in 2006. Yeah, I remember that because I remember. Yeah, I mean we weren't. My team wasn't a very strong programming team, and we had like eight autons that were just what arc our robot would drive in. I really liked that auton. I liked the interactive nature of it. I liked that it was your auton to lose, but it wasn't someone's game to win. Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, you you bring up a good point of. Like, I remember, like, one of the pit scouting things was, do you have an auto? And if the answer was no, it's how can I help you? Not just, oh, DNP. It's how can I help you? Yeah. Because you're probably going to play with that team. And, I mean, starting in front of a human player and not having an auto was a, was a bad time. Right. Let's talk about this game from an audience perspective. How, how was the game for the audience? Was it, was it good? Was it, you know, easy to follow? Um, Peyton, what do you think about that? So, so this one is, I, I tend to relate this game to uh, Little League kind of soccer where everybody is kind of just running into each other because they think the, the main task or the game piece is in the middle of this giant mass. So from time to time, based on why I can see it's, it's a little bit hard to follow. Uh, it's a fairly easy task, the idea of you've got a target on your back and everybody is trying to put stuff on your target and you're trying to do the same thing to everybody else. So from a game mechanic standpoint, it's pretty simple. 
but the fact that the targets are always moving and you got robots running into each other either on purpose trying to pin them or on accident because they're sliding on the slick floor uh that's kind of uh, chaos to unfolding before your very eyes so um that might make it a little bit hard for some spectators and i think the other thing that probably makes it hard for spectators is there's no automatic scoring uh involved so most people nowadays see uh, a game piece go through a, a gap in the wall or a game piece be hung on a peg and then that is scored mostly by the system and in 2009 everybody was on the side of the field as a scorekeeper with a little clicker trying to count how fast each robot dumped balls into another robot's trailer and so you look at the end of the match and they're hand counting and the scores are fluctuating so much just because people aren't able to keep up as robots are performing their actions throughout the match yeah and katie you said you were on drive team um it was it's pretty difficult to figure out like you, you basically had to ignore the live scoring to, to determine if you're winning you had to scan the field continuously every five seconds right yeah uh so i was gonna say flip side is that you could look at trailers and just kind of say like those trailers are full of balls those ones aren't and do a little bit of you know which one looks bigger um i have heard from the audience i have again like i was on drive team so i didn't have an audience view that the game was a little frustrating because it was so slow um, because robots took forever to accelerate, um, it just meant that and there's a lot of stop and go. So it was a ra rather slow match. And when you got robots in this tangle of little kids in the middle of the field, uh, those could be slow to dissipate. So from that, like that part, I know it was not an exciting game for audiences. Um, and also the supercell, the empty cell supercell, that was completely invisible to an audience member. Um, right. You just notice that at 20 seconds, all the robots would like be hiding in corners. So the, the, the human players were really powerful in this game, right? Like, we talk about the supercell and the empty cell and such. Um, I I was on a, on a drive team as well, and I remember at our first event, we got baited really hard. Um, we had no idea the there was a supercell that was usable, and they had traded the empty cell so you could use the supercell in one corner, and they basically parked one of their robots with that had an empty trailer in that corner. And they... They basically waited for some one of us on on that alliance to have a, a robot full of game pieces, and they as soon as they as soon as they got in the corner, they had another one come up and pin us, and drop the super solid and win the match. Like, like the the human player had a ton of power in this game. I say I think one of the things you mentioned is uh, with the human player. The obviously, uh, it's one of those skill based actions where some of our later games human players can kind of be comprised of a whole gambit of uh, skill sets because uh, they don't require you to do the actual scoring for most of the portion. Uh, having somebody strapped into a seat on the side of the field, tossing moon rocks onto the field into trailers as robots drive by, and the, the level of skill that some of these people uh, work towards to be able to do that is fairly impressive that I, I don't think a whole lot of uh, more modern games uh, take advantage of. I mean, you'd have teams recruiting kids from the basketball team to be their human player. Or, I mean, you would see in the later rounds of the draft, teams would be picking other teams for their human player. Um, in Midwest, there was one team where, like, their robot was okay. It was a robot. It wasn't any worse than my robot, so I can't really say much. Um, but their human player was an ace. She, uh, as soon as you got the supercell in her hand, like it was over because she would nail it no matter what. I was against her in finals or semifinals, and it was terrifying because as soon as she had it, you just heard everyone on our alliance yelling, "Get away from the wall! Get away from that wall!" Um, because the human players were, they would win matches, um, especially in the early rounds when you know week one, week two, robots aren't that strong, and there wasn't a whole lot that could limit their power. Uh, so the ones that were strapped in the seats. They at least, like, once they ran out of game pieces, that was it. But then the ones in the corner, you could have robots hurting balls to them to then, like, throw onto, into the trailers. Um, it was really cool because I think it brought in this, like, sports meets science, um, which there's a section of first who loves that. And it was really cool in that way. But it was also frustrating that you could spend six weeks building a robot, um, trying your best or not, and then to be obliterated by a kid with, with a supercell. So this is one of the last few games where your opponent's score had a big impact on the rankings, which we're going to talk a lot more about likely in 2010. Mm -hmm. But in this game, 
I, I've always found it weird where, um, uh, Katie, I found it, it was weird where it was advantageous to design your robot to be able to score on yourself to, to, to uh, affect your ranking. You want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, my team was not that meta. Um, so yeah, this is back in the day where your what part of your ranking score was just based off your opponent's score. Um, I don't know if it was a differential or how it was done. Um, but yeah, so the idea was that you were being rewarded for your strength of schedule. And so if you scored 60 points and your sc opponent scored two points, well, obviously that was just a really easy match. So you shouldn't get as many uh, ranking points as the team who scored 40 points, but their opponent scored 32 points. So, I mean, the idea is that it's supposed to be a strength of schedule, but what really happens is teams who are building, playing the rankings uh, strategically realize that if they're going to have a blowout match, uh, that actually isn't good. And so you start coming up with ways like, okay, how can I score on my, my teammates? Um, well, what if my teammates don't want me to do that because they might not understand why? Uh, I think some of the teams that had the, the turrets, I don't know what you call them. They were like the death rays is how I thought of them. Uh, I'm sure some of them, could they turn around and turret into their own basket? I vividly remember watching 11-14 uh, Symbotics like clearly leading a match and it's like 45 seconds left to go. They go, all right. And they just start driving around and they point their turret back and every single game piece that goes through the robot ends up in their own trailer. I was like, what? <laughs> so this is where you're going to confuse grandma is when you say having balls in your trailer is bad. And then you have these teams putting balls in their trailer. They're like, well, that just doesn't make sense. <laughs> There's a lot of this in our next game in, in 2010. I'm gonna have to switch gears to it because this is a good segue um, of, of Breakaway where the, you can describe that game in one sentence, robot soccer. Yep. Um, Peyton, this was your first year as a student. Um, how, how did this game get played? So yeah, like you mentioned, it was robot soccer. So the field was not wide open such as Lunacy, but was divided into thirds by one of the more challenging obstacles that I've ever seen. And it was a foot tall ramp with a 45 degree angle on either side. So it was incredibly steep and divided the field into sections. And so robots had to kind of think whether they needed to be able to drive over these big dividers or in the center of the field, there were these very low tunnels that your robot could drive through to move from zone to zone. And so uh, robots had to take turns essentially moving soccer balls from one zone up to the next one, similar to normal robot soccer is, uh, and then score in one of two zone or goals in the uh, end zone. One of the interesting facets about the end zone is uh, with two goals, they limited you to a single defending robot in the opponent's scoring zone. Um, so this really made it challenging for one defender to be able to block out both goals. And I think that's uh, a great design ideology of making sure that defense is uh, allowed, but not making it so overpowered uh, where a single robot can shut down the entire flow of the game. And that was uh, a very enforceable defense rule too. Um, it was very like, there's one robot in this zone. There, there's no gray about it. Similar to normal soccer, where uh, with each game piece being worth a single point, uh, throughout the whole match, you would oftentimes see scores of less than 10 to versus 10 kind of thing, just based on the point value of the game piece, which is an interesting thing is if you compare the just point value of a game piece to the end game uh, being so similar, it kind of undervalued end game. And, and what was that end game task? So the end game task that year was threefold. So you had the ability to get one point for getting your robot above a certain level on top of a platform on the tunnel. Uh, you could get two points for grabbing onto a bar or a vertical bar and elevating yourself above that platform. Or you could get a, an additional bonus point if you could hang your robot off of an already suspended robot. Did anyone ever do the buddy hang? I I feel like like one of the teams that that did it was the engineers, right? Twenty three thirty seven, yeah. right? I know the engineers um, had a um, a really unique robot where. Um, the back of their robot basically replicated the geometry of 
the bars that were already there. So the intent was that it would be really easy for their partners to um, be able to climb on it because it's a replica of what was already there. Um, now, I, I think that they maybe were successful a few times, but mm -hmm. the point values weren't really that rewarding for, for attempting it compared to you know, scoring one additional point or, or that. Yeah, it was a huge amount of effort to achieve that for a, like a pretty diminishing return, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it could take a long time because this was back when the rules were at rest. Um, so if you are if you started climbing and the buzzer went and you sagged, well... Which, yeah. which helped out some teams, namely 67, because they had a passive climb. And once it deployed, it would continue to help them climb even after the buzzer. Yeah, so the post-buzzer ascension is like... Maybe the coolest thing to come out of 2010? Because, yeah, you had 67 and 1625. Those were the two that come to mind of the... They had the gas shots. Uh, so they would run to the tower at, like, one second left, and you're like, oh, it's over for them. All they had to do was latch on and hit a button. Buzzer goes, and then you see... It was lovely. It was excellent. Yeah, that was hugely inspiring for me as a student of, like... Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that makes sense. They actually read the rules. Um, <laughs> like that was hugely inspiring to me. Oh, that's pretty cool. Whereas like other teams who like built, you know, these these pole climbers, whether they like grabbed and flipped or they they ran up the pole, uh, most of the teams were fully motor powered for that. The the sixty the the innovation robot particularly was super inspiring to me of watching them take that action and just pack it into the yeah. end game. So there there's a lot of a lot of other weird things in this game, um, namely the the theme of this game, and there's a lot of pathways we're going to talk about, I think, um, is the game design committee really had a very specific vision of how this game was going to be played and how the robots would interact with game. There's a lot of pathways here, but Katie, let's let's talk a little bit about like how they try to make it really robot soccer. Teams, I feel like since the dawn of time, had figured out how to manipulate balls. Um, that was just a thing everyone knew how to do. So they turned that on its head. You were not allowed to have the ball more than two inches inside your frame perimeter. Um, so they were really trying to go for this, like, how you dribble a soccer ball. You don't hold the soccer ball, you dribble it. So that was a big thing. You could only really manipulate one at a time. Although there wasn't, you couldn't hold a ball, so there wasn't really a holding. Um, and so if you're going to manipulate multiple, if you had a ball touching beyond your two inches inside your frame perimeter, it had to be completely passive, um, which comes into effect later. I assume we're going to talk about that. <laughs> but for right now, you could only, like, actively manipulate one ball at a time, two inches inside your frame perimeter. Uh, so this was a new mechanism for teams, because no one had made anything like this. And this, I think this was probably the biggest design challenge for teams, was how do you have a ball stick to you when you only have two inches of it? Because these are, like, nine-inch balls. It's not like it's, not like it's a four-inch ball and two inches is giving you a controlling majority of it. Um. It was hard, and the bumper rules that year were very different because of the height of the balls. So the bumper zone was uh, increased to help you control the balls. Um, but clearly, kind of what we were probably going for was that you wouldn't have a whole lot of control over it, and so you'd do, be doing a lot of passing, which didn't really play out. A lot of teams figured out, teams, as they do, figured out how to hold a ball and how to get it from where they are to where they need to be. Uh, we saw teams that were doing full field kicks, which I, in my naivety, I didn't think that was possible. Um, and I'm sure the GDC probably wasn't expecting either. They were probably expecting a lot of zone to zone. Um, so you saw a lot of team. you saw some teams doing these full field kicks. Um, you were a good team if you could get it over the hurdles because those were tall. And if you didn't clear them, it would mess up the trajectory of the ball because it'd like roll up this ramp and then who knows where it goes. Yeah, the the whole like ball magnet, not quite arms race, um, was super interesting because there was this large online community of people like trying to figure out what was legal and what was what wasn't. Right, the the whole key of like game pieces to stay on the ground, but you would see real videos where people are using these mechanisms. The game piece stays on the ground, but then they drive it into the goal and it would come off the ground. And there was like this whole hullabaloo around that. Right. Yeah, some of the most successful mechanisms that year were on the very, very borderline of legality and being illegal. Um, what so do you let's, let's just put a name on it, right? It was vacuums. <laughs> yeah. 
I think the double roller was also the same way where you touch the top and the bottom of the ball, but because the ball was still touching the floor, it was counted as legal. Yeah, and I don't I don't remember first ever officially legal on vacuums because personally I was because I have, you know, all this moral standing, I was like, vacuums are against the rules and I was probably just salty that we didn't come up with a good ball mechanism. <laughs> but yeah, I remember I remember the controversy over it because yeah, the idea was the ball has to stay on the ground. Was it incidental that when they pushed it into the goal it came off the ground, or was it breaking the rules and will the ref call it or like this is a game where you had to know your refs right um and there were all kinds of rules about these mechanisms that like the again in the same vein of the game design committee wanted to really control what robots did um like there was this like chart in the manual about extensions right um Peyton do you do you remember this whole flow of like the two second rule and such yeah it was a it was a really hard thing for us to try to make sure our mechanism was legal because it's hard to gauge uh based on the the way the ruling was is you could have an extension outside of your robot frame perimeter uh as if you were like to kick the ball or to score the ball but the ruling was you could only do it for a certain amount of time and then it needed to be back inside the robot uh and it's really hard on some of our systems to verify that the mechanism was fully back within the robot. And so it's kind of one of those rules that was very hard to enforce uh, from a refereeing side because it's hard to see, A, with the with the bumpers being there and whether they retracted it in enough time because most people aren't carrying around stopwatches and every time a robot makes an action, they start them. So it's a, one of those rulings that I think is there mostly for safety and was just very hard to enforce uh, in practicality. Also, I feel like for modern students, they're going to not understand why that was a big deal. And robots were different. Um, I think the wide, the widespread use of sensors and the way they're used now was not as common. Um, I would say, like, I was on a medium good team. Like, I was on a decent team. And we didn't learn. We couldn't. We didn't use encoders until my senior year. Like, um, sensors and good programming was still relatively rare. And so teams now would be like, oh, well, you just put a limit switch on it, and then you auto-cock your, your kicker or whatever. And it's like, no, that wasn't a thing. Teams had to remember to manually do it. Mm-hmm. I think teams also need to realize the, like uh, I think Danny was saying in the previous, or in the session one, is teams had to design to the technology and the limits that were in place at the time. So that yes. was one of the years where we had a, a motor limit for pretty much every motor had a limit on how many you could use. Uh, so if you wanted to use your five sim motors, you're probably using one for your each portion of your drivetrain, and then maybe one to climb, which didn't leave you a whole lot of power. So teams really had to pick and choose which subsystems were very refined, and other ones that uh, kind of just got the job done. Yeah, definitely. I remember that. That's actually the first year where we had more than four sims. Right? Was was the additional sim number five showed up in, mm-hmm. in 2010. Moving away from game pieces for a minute um is there were there were lots of other rules about about climbing right because everybody what we had seen is based off of previous research every climbing game there's a horizontal bar and you grab the horizontal bar and raise yourself up Mm -hmm. and then we went to i think championships and that was the first time we'd really seen climbers and we saw all these robots that were grabbing the vertical bar and rotating like 90 degrees to be above the platform and that really kind of blew our minds. It's like, this is a completely different approach that is different than any other year had been at that point, but is still legal per the rules. And I think it really goes to show you that everybody can look at the manual and interpret the rules in a legal fashion completely differently. Uh, and there's the difference between like intent versus application. It's really impressive. Well, also there hadn't been recent games ahead climbing. You know, what was the first time, what was the most recent climbing before 2010, 2004? Yeah, so it wasn't, there wasn't as much resources of looking back and saying like, oh, you can climb a bar in 12 different ways. Uh, we, everyone kind of, I think everyone thought of the, the chin up um, because that's how you think of climbing a bar. And that was probably how they showed us in the game design video or in the animation. Um, and I know the animation, they're not trying to give you ideas, 
but there's definitely some hints of what the the committee intended. So, um, in addition to the climbing aspect on the towers, um, it also kind of aided in returning game pieces to the field. Uh, Katie, could you talk a little bit about how that dynamic worked and how the game pieces got recycled back? Yeah, so after 2009, so here's what I think happened. In 2008, uh, human players did nothing for most of the match, except for like the five teams that had a remote control in the first 15 seconds for autonomous. So then in 2009, they're like, we need game players to be relevant again. So then they made them too relevant. So then 2010, they're like, that was terrible. Let's not do that again. Uh, so they backed it up, and game pl- game play- or, uh, human players were how game pieces got back onto the field. So uh, the balls would come in through the sides. Your human player would go pick it up from there, and then there's a human player in the middle with a trident, literally a trident. You load the ball into the trident, and then you'd, like, stick it up high and, you know, release the ball onto some rails. Rails went over the first uh, third of the field, um, and those towers were the return area. So they would effectively kind of just bounce into the middle. Uh, Every game is a cycling game, pretty much. This game especially. So this return led to an interesting how can you increase your cycles. I mean, like, this is the most recent version of a game break. I don't know, they were so close to breaking the game, it's sad that they didn't win. Uh, so beca- there are all these weird rules about climbing the tower, and FIRST has gotten better at clarifying when you can do endgame tasks. So you're allowed to, like, react with the tower because of endgame, but I don't think there are a whole lot of rules about when. So 469, everyone, every team probably had the idea of, LOL, what if we just redirected the balls that come back in into the goals? Because what happens is when you score, uh, the balls would go up and they'd come down and you could sit there and just punt them back into the goal for you to get a point. So every team said, LOL, what if? But I think a lot of teams get stuck in, but that's not what the rules want. So then 469 was like, yeah, but actually, uh, so they created a robot that sat on top, and this is where this, like, passive ball manipulation comes into play. So what they had is they had two ramps. They would catch the balls that came down, and it would slide down one of their two ramps. Um, and as long as nothing on their robot actuated while it was on their robot, it was legal. Um, so if a robot was blocking one of the goals... In between the balls coming, they had a little, like, railway switch, and they would just switch which rail the ball went down. Um, and they destroyed the game. It was beautiful. Uh, right. If you were against them, tough luck. But it was beautiful. And, then, and also, he, go on. There were a few specific, like, it was like a perfect storm of the collection of rules that yes. made that robot possible, right? Well, if I recall correctly, your human players could, uh, you couldn't hoard pieces. So I think, like, you could hoard maybe three, because I think each human player could hold one, and that was about the extent of it. There were um, some really <laughs> complex rules about returning um, game pieces to the field that year. Peyton, maybe you remember some of those rules and how they affected Yeah, we got, we got uh, into some trouble at Worlds based off of the, what they called delay of game penalties. So essentially, when a soccer ball was scored in a goal it passed through a sensor so this was nice because it automated scoring so every time a ball goes through the goal the sensor picks up the value and then automatically assigns the point the problem comes is uh, if you don't return the ball back onto the field through the return sensor uh, with enough time you lose uh, the point and then for every additional amount of time after then uh, it should have been returned you lose another point which uh, became an issue with if a ball goes through the sensor and another ball goes through the sensor without it breaking, it only reads N minus one balls uh, and then continuously automatically deducts points from your alliance. So it became an issue uh, of teams essentially not being able to score fast enough to overcome the penalties to no fault of their own. And... If I recall correctly, this may have been only the second time we had some kind of ball counter sensor on the field ever in the first robotics competition. Um, the previous one would have been 2006, and everything else was hand counted prior to that, as far as I remember. 
yeah, it's important you pick up on when two balls went through at the same time, Peyton, is because the sensors were mounted directly in the center of the ball pathway. Meaning, like, when you think about, I'm trying to count a ball, um, you want to make sure you have the maximum possibility of seeing the center of a circle, right? Um, and when two went through, it counted as one. This was a hard lesson for um, the game design committee to, to learn, but it was an important one because every other ball counter after that was not on center line. It was mounted off of center line to see those gaps of multiple game pieces go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there were also, you know, other instances, right? So if a ball went through the goal and a human player, you know, lost it and it rolled away, um, there were some times where they could get behind schedule and every other subsequent ball was delayed after that. And, um, it, you know, for those teams that happen to have mistakes that happen, um, it, it turned into just a mess. <laughs> and, you know, the then their score is perpetually leading towards zero, especially in a game like we talked about where the scores were low anyway, kind of lent itself towards this 469 robot and this design of a perpetual loop of game pieces are always going through. Right. Katie, you alluded to this a little bit, but the, the 469 robot itself was protected when it was touching the tower, right? Yeah, I forgot about that. You couldn't touch robots touching the tower. Um, that was part of the end game. Again, this is kind of part of the end game rules that they didn't really... So I don't think that you're... So normally in years we have this, like, at 30 seconds, it's end game, and all the end game strategies are protected. You know, don't mess with robots while they're climbing. So when you have those rules, but you don't have a time limit, then you get the 469 thing of, ha ha, we're on your tower and you can't touch us. Because if you, that was probably a technical penalty, which is probably like five points. Mm -hmm. And that is really, you know, like that's an insurmountable point difference. When your average score that year is like six points, five points is impossible. Uh, I yeah. mean, it's, you look at the averages on the blue lines and it's like, the average at champs was 13 points. Like, even then, five points is going to ruin your match. Mm -hmm. So this 469 robot was involved in probably one of the most famous matches of that year. Um, was match 100 on Kiri, which was like the, the, sh the show stage for 6v0. With the, we talked a little bit about how your opponent's score was a big part of your rankings. This is probably like a prime example of how this can go not necessarily in the direction the GC intended. Um, Peyton, what was all this 6v0 about and like help us unpack that, that whole thing. Yeah. So this is probably one of my favorite examples of knowing how, uh, reading the manual first off and understanding what's important for ranking. So, uh, based on the way the ranking system was that year, the winner of the match got the penalized version of the winner's score plus, uh, I believe two times the loser's score unpenalized plus five points. And then the loser got the winner's unpenalized score. What came down to in at champs was there's in a case where a team was going to go against another team and it was against 469 and knowing that they would most likely lose and the more points that they would score would just pad the ranking for 469 in that alliance. So what the arrangement came out to be is if everybody plays offense for one side and racks up the score as high as possible, the winner would get their score. Uh, and since they're with no penalties, plus five, and then two times the loser score, which was likely just going to be zero. And so the loser would get the winner's score without penalties, which would essentially be the same minus that five point buffer. So it worked out in most of the team's favor to all play for the same alliance in a grand scheme of things, uh, which really led to an odd game where everybody was scoring for the same side and nobody was playing defense. Uh, and it's just very awkward to look at and be like, what is going on? They're all playing on the same side. Well, if I recall correctly, the other team was one like 11-14, who then partnered with 469 and you know went to Einstein through no real fault of those two teams, uh, some bad things happened. Robots got stuck in goals and everything went sad. But, <laughs> um, yeah. But, I don't but, know if the GDC could have prevented that, though. I think that was just bad luck. Well, I and, think that's the, the thing is, like, if you think about it, if we're only going to allow one defender, 
you would think that there's always the opportunity for the other goal to be scored on. And when you think about it, if an offensive robot gets stuck in the goal, you, I don't think you ever planned for, for something like that to happen. You don't. <laughs> no, definitely not. It, like, why would you ever want to be stuck in your own goal? Why yeah. like, would that be a thing? And I think that's part of the, one of the things that the GDC did was they made a lip to the goal so that balls would go in and then not roll back out. And I think that's one of the things that you do thinking that it's going to help. And in a lot of cases it does, but you don't think of the unintended consequence of, well, maybe somebody's going to get stuck on that lip. I, I want to go back to the 6v0 part a little bit, Katie, um, because there was a lot of controversy about this strategy, right? And it was a matter of perspective of micro for the match versus macro for the entire event, right? Well, yeah, I mean, you have, I've been on both types of mindsets now. Uh, you have teams who are playing to win the match. Um, and I, these tend to be, I would say, like the less experienced teams. Um, because they, you, you're not thinking, when you're playing basketball in like your youth league, you're not thinking like, I have to do certain things to win the tournament. You're just like, I have to win the game. Um, and that's how like traditional sports plays and first is like a sport. So yeah, there's a lot of teams who are like, no, you have to win the match. That's the goal. And then you have these teams who their goal is to win a regional or to win worlds. And so their long-term strategy is no, you have to rank number one or you have to rank number two. Like you have to rank high. Who cares about like winning a match if it affects your rank? Like we're going for ranking points. Um, so this really upset teams because some teams consider it un GP not gracious professionalism to not try and win. And we've seen this happen in other sports. Uh, like, I don't know, Olympics badminton one year had a whole thing where teams were throwing matches to place themselves better in the tournament. So they could get a, is like, if you did really well, you'd place the best team and lose immediately. But if you lost, then you placed a not as good team and you might get third. So you, like we've seen this in other sports and other sports all have their way of handling it. Um, so teams, yeah, that people were upset about this because in their mind, not trying to win, it didn't it didn't make sense because not everyone is thinking of the rankings game, which strategically, poor choice. Think of the rankings game. I mean, that six v zero match was wild because it was also the highest score of like it was thirty one points, which again, the average score was like six. So this was crazy. And it was, I mean, it was super impactful. Like basically, like I I was a student then, and I remember. Pretty much anybody who was at all a strategy brain in first that was attending that championship left their own fields to watch this match. I have never, ever, ever seen a yeah. crowd that big for a qualifications match at the championship. I remember I was an FTA on that field and suddenly like everything was just really crowded and there were just people coming from everywhere surrounding the field to watch this match. And it was like, Oh yeah, this is that match that's coming up with the uh, one fourteen and court sixty nine, right? Right. right. Yeah. It. Whenever you talk about twenty ten, we still talk about the court sixty nine robot, but Always. basically every other sentence, right? So, um, I think, like personally, the only reason that robot could exist is because of the mindset of the game design committee that year of trying to shape every second of every match by framing up different parts mm -hmm. of of exactly how robot play, right, Peyton? Like. If you, you put up a bunch of walls, they actually draw the pathway for something to exist, right? Yeah, because if you think about how I think the game design committee intended is the ball would go through the goal, the human player would put it back onto the field, and based on the structure, the return rack uh, would either drop it in the middle of the field, but since there's a tunnel uh, on, right at the end of that return rack, I think the idea is that the ball would roll back towards the other zone so kind of keep a flow of traffic so teams would score and then the ball wouldn't readily be available to them. Uh, and so teams, lots of teams went out and said, well, this is kind of the cycle of the game. What can we do to shorten that cycle? And similar to 469 on the redirecting, there are plenty of teams that uh, specifically design the robot around the middle zone, whether that's just blocking balls and hoping that they go back or uh, being very good midfielders. So 2010, great game. Um, we could probably spend the entire show talking about all of the meta strategies and like little nuanced details of Breakaway. Um, but let's keep going and let's look at um, the new turn of the decade, um, the 2011 game, Logomotion. Uh, Katie, what was this crazy game all about? All right, so Logomotion, 
uh, looked really familiar to anyone who had been around since 2007 or 97 if you were that old. So what you had is you had inflatable, these inflated tubes uh, in the shapes of a triangle, circle, and square. Uh, because the big deal is it was the 20th anniversary of first. Uh, teams had to put these tubes on these, um, in a, like, an array of pegs and form the first logo six times. So, and you got points for where you formed it. So if you had a tube on the highest level, you got more points. If you had a tube on the lowest level, you got less points. And in Autonomous, the teams had a super tube, uber tube, something like that. Uh, it was a yellow circle, and you would put that anywhere, and that would double the amount of points, I believe, that that peg had scored. Mm -hmm. So on top of scoring tubes, uh, there was also the mini bots. And so the mini bots were, there were four poles in the middle of the field, roughly, uh, and teams had to attach these Tetric mini bots to climb the poles, and it was a race. Um, so at the last 10 seconds, teams could deploy a mini bot. You got 30 points for first place, uh, 20 points for second place, 15 for third, and 10 for fourth. Um, and so, and then the match ended when all four mini bots had reached the pedestal at the very top. Um, this was the pressure it was very similar to 2017 in that there was a pressure plate at the top that you had to hit, and voila, you won the mini bot race. Like the theme of scoring for this game is, is diminishing returns, right? Both the um, the mini bot race was a diminishing return. You know, the the slower you were, the less points you got. Like, kind of naturally makes sense, but. Also, Peyton, the scoring on the rack was also a diminishing return, right? Yeah. So one of the interesting things about scoring on the rack is obviously you get the more points, the higher up on the rack you place, but you get more points if you put the logo together, uh, especially if it's on top of your autonomous Uber tube. And so if you think about it from a points perspective, if you place everything along the top of the rack uh, and then the middle of the rack, any points you would have been scoring by finishing out and completing the whole rack uh, were very minimal because the lower portion was only worth one point per peg. Uh, so a lot of teams did neglect to even worry about the lower levels. And speaking of the rack, it's it's interesting how teams uh, did scoring on the rack in a different order than you might consider because you were scoring on yourself. And so any game piece you scored in, depending on how tall you were, might obstruct your vision, making it hard to continue scoring or maneuver to the minibot poles for the end game. Right. And that the obstruction of vision, I think, actually drove a really big shift in how people drive their robots. Prior to 2011, a lot of teams used large, you know, flight, everyone runs the flight sticks, right? They use a couple large joysticks to drive their robots. And then all of a sudden, your vision was sometimes obstructed with if assuming you get to that middle row, a lot of people switched to game pads that year and haven't looked back since. Yeah, um, because, you know, you are allowed to move around somewhat in the driver's station. So if you have a logo in front of, like, the grid was literally on the plexiglass of your driver's station. So you were also making logos backwards, which was fun. Uh, if you had an inexperienced drive coach tell you to put the square on the wrong side, and you had good drivers who listened to you, you scored less points. So yeah, you'd cover yourself. So you would see teams uh, with really long USB cables wandering over to their neighbor's driver station so that they could still see the field. Um, and you even had uh, one team modified a drum harness to put their whole driver station in a transportable, like, thing. Um, because yeah, vision was really interesting. This is probably one of the first years that you really started to see drivers and coaches running around across the drive station. And I find it an interesting, um, we were all really worried about this, but if you look at the majority of match scores, like nine times out of 10, there were no tubes on that middle rack. Yes. But we were all worried about it, right, Peyton? Yeah, uh, that was my first year actually on the driving portion of drive team. And uh, it was one of those, uh, we brought it up early on in the strategy meetings, like, well, if we place where it's easiest to place, it might be harder for us to see making the subsequent ones harder to place. And then we found in practice that with everything being scored on the top row first, uh, it really, we were able to score without a whole lot of additional issues worrying about the middle. One of the, one of the things that we, we talked about pre-show for this was um, the idea of the return of protected zones. It had been quite a few years since robots had been like fully protected 
when they were doing the you know the primary bulk task of scoring game pieces we talked about you know 469 being protected with the tower and endgame but this is the first time in many years katie where um you were protected when you were doing the thing right yeah so this allowed teams to kind of think about holonomic drivetrains um, which was like a side effect of that rule um but the idea was that like and we see this come now it's a kind of a modern it's a thing we see in every modern game um of when you're doing the actual scoring task, I think what happened is the GDIC recognized that these pick and place tasks are hard. And if we make it harder by having a defender, you know, ramming the robot, you know, we're going to make this game impossible for anyone. Uh, so yeah, we saw this protected zone. It was about uh, three or six feet from the Alliance wall. So um, basically, as if the robot was placing a tube, uh, they were protected. Um, and then there were also protected rules about placing mini bots, but we've seen end game protections before, so that's not that weird. Uh, this really gave teams a lot of freedom because it meant that they could try for this task without worrying about another robot, you know, destroying them in the process. Um, and it also meant that teams felt more confident with holonomic drivetrains because typically you have less traction, but now you have this protected zone, so it can help you line up of like, okay, line up, shift over to the right a little bit, in theory. And that really, I think, opened teams up to these ideas and probably helped perpetuate the McCandom wheel. What are you going to do? I think that's really true, um, being protected. And um, another thing that probably contributed to that is that the, the human player aspect, Peyton, was, we, you know, we've seen kind of so far in our show, we've seen like the ebb and flow of the utility of the human player, right? But I, the human player role in this, in this game kind of got back to being a little more directly impactful, right? Yeah, I, I would say that the human player role that year was incredibly impactful to the flow of the match. And if you think about how the field is set up with the scoring zone being on the opposite side of the field as the loading zone, that puts an interesting dynamic for drive teams in general because they're now isolated from their human player. So we saw a lot of signaling devices, uh, hand signals, telling the human player what game piece he wanted. Uh, because that was a year you had three different types of game pieces. And so being able to communicate across the field is something that uh, uh, good teams got very good at being able to do. And then I think the way that the game design committee set up the field made it so they intended for the human player to feed through the slot. And one of the uh, fun side effects of giving a bunch of teams a, a manual and saying this is the game our teams figure out legally how to do things that maybe weren't intended to be done. So such is the case as the human players getting really, really good at throwing game pieces halfway across the field, which significantly can shorten how long it takes a game piece to go from not scored to scored. Uh, and so I think it's very interesting how uh, the dynamic of a, a good human player can severely make a, a, a mid-tier robot seem like a... a great tier robot just because they're putting up so much more game pieces when they only have to drive half as far. Well, yeah, it was about like shortening your cycle. And so I always thought it was really fun because at the first, you know, the first weeks or two, you see human players kind of like lob. And then by chance, you have human players who have spent every meeting with a piece of string across the hallway and practicing like their technique. It was crazy. You would see t human players who would be like, I'm going to nail it in this spot right there. And they would do it. And then you even saw some instances of human players uh, lobbing and making scoring. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of teams got really good at figuring out where their weaknesses were too. When they when they did this practicing, um, it was a lot easier to get the round game piece, you know, the circle, all the way into your protected zone, whereas the triangle flew really poorly, right? So like you see a lot of teams who would they would use the human player to get the triangle or not triangle, the circle and the square downfield, but they would maybe be a little more conservative with the triangle because they'd be worried about losing it midfield. Yeah, I mean, throwing the, the object had the advantage of shortening your cycle time, but had the disadvantage of now that's anyone's game piece. Mm -hmm. So you had to be really careful of, uh, you don't want to, you know, your human player had to be smart. They had to know when to throw because if they throw it too early, then the other lines can steal that piece. And if they throw it, you know, if they throw it too late, then great. Now you just wasted five seconds. Right. And that that combo right there opened up the door, Peyton, for a really, like, really impactful metagame about tube starvation, right? 
Yeah, so tube starvation was something that most teams didn't have to worry about on the, the regional level, but definitely by the time you get to higher gameplay where teams are really thinking out how the, the dynamics of the match are going to go, which, when to throw out which game piece and when to starve the other team of certain game pieces. Uh, talking about the protected zones earlier, not only was the scoring zone a protected zone, but the loading zone was a protected zone. And so oftentimes teams would push game pieces into the scoring zones just to keep them out of the hands of the other alliance and, and further enforce this game uh, starvation kind of technique. Yeah, yeah, you definitely saw um, robots who weren't very good at placing taking this runner route. Um, you didn't see it very often because it just wasn't very efficient. But you would see them going from protected zone to protected zone, just running game pieces. You know, picking a little bit on those protected zones and, and the penalties around them, it's it's rare in first to see the idea of taking a penalty to net a positive result. And the way the points worked out with entering your opponent's loading zone, if you had, it was a positive effect. Um, if you if you had a logo that had an Uber tube in it that was not completed but that tube was sitting in your opponent's um, loading zone, it was still advantageous points-wise to grab that tube, take the small penalty for a much larger points rewards right in front of you. Um, and that was probably not a thing the GDC ever intended, which like is weird because we, we, we've learned from that now, right? Like we, yeah. we have, you know, in modern games, we have more qualifiers on that, whether it's, you know, robot and entry or it's like uh, a time of existence in that zone. Um, instead of just being like a, a black and white, you've entered the zone, here's your five point penalty, whatever it is. Yeah, I remember that being a huge penalty issue. Don't worry about what you're doing. Yeah. Definitely, because it was it was right, that, that zone line was right where you were driving to go score. And so if you like clipped your opponent's mini bot tower, you may inadvertently grab a penalty on your way to trying to score points, right? Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I think part of that, like you were saying, the decision to take a penalty to score more points is uh, one of those cost benefit kind of like on the fly reactions where you completing a task can score you so many more points than any of the negative repercussions of taking the penalty. And it's one of the factors of uh, non-linear game piece scoring where one does not necessarily equal one. One interesting mechanic, right, is the, the mini bot race and its effect on, on the map, right? Katie, do you want to talk about how that, how the how the race affected the length of the match and such? Your the minibot could cut ten seconds off the match because the match ended when all the minibots, all four, had touched the pedestals. Um, so on one hand, if you were ahead and you had good minibots, like go for it. Um, if you were behind, this created an interesting like: Do you want to put the minibot up or do you want to finish the logo? The answer is always minibot because. What happened is the point balancing needed some work. Um, you know, it was three points for a tube on a high peg, two points for middle peg, uh, some bonus in there. I think it was a 2x bonus for a logo. But compa like comparing those numbers to 30 points, the logos just didn't matter. Um, and that was a, a thing, that was a points balancing that the GDC probably could have done a little better because we found that just the mini bots were king. They won the match, they lost the match. Um, mm -hmm. And this is kind of, you'd see the bottom row was almost never filled out. And it's because that was six points. It just, it wasn't worth it when a minibot can earn 10. Like the slowest minibot in the world could earn 10 points. One, one of the advice uh, pieces we had from Danny in session one is like the, the last thing you should do is assign points to a task, right? And you do that um, by trying, one of the ways, you, a strategy is to try to figure out exactly how hard the task was. Um, it is plausible, um, my speculation, personal speculation, that the game design committee may have expected the minibot task to be harder than it actually ended up being, maybe reflected in the in you know that that big point swing, right? Yeah, and I think um, you know the points were so high for that first place minibot, um, it lent itself to really teams kind of obsessing over the design of that minibot. Um, Peyton, you were on a team then. Uh, te minibots got so fast and so small, and and the designs were kind of um, uh, converging on each other by the time we got to championship. Yeah, uh, I had the pleasure of talking to someone that helped early on in the prototyping with first on the minibot challenge, yeah. and their interpretation based off of the testing they had done 
was they thought a competitive mini bot by like the upper level of regionals and maybe by champs was going to be about four and a half seconds from deployed to touching the top. And they were quite in awe by the end of the game when mini bots were sub one second to get to the top. And so it really kind of goes to show you what you expect based on your initial testing and what teams can come up with uh, based on what you've provided them. And so, yeah, by the time we got to champs, mini bots were, I think, initially planned to be a collaboration between FRC teams and FTC teams to kind of bring the programs together to work in a field that an FRC team probably wouldn't have the most experience on. And really, by the time like the worlds came around, it was, okay, so the rules say I have to have only use these types of motors and have to have this battery on it. And that is the only things that I will put on my robot now because those are the minimum requirements. And you get to a point where you're, all the mini bots kind of are essentially the same, where it's just the motor, no gearbox, no wheel, and the battery pack. And so- right. And a magnet. And, and a magnet. This, this is a good example of like the game design committee and, and first as a whole really trying to steer exactly what teams do during a season like to the point of you got a Tetrix kit in your kit of parts. That was, you know, that was the standard back then for first tech challenge of they all built out of the Tetrix build system. And the intent was here are the parts that your, your first tech challenge teams use, as you said, you should use these too. It didn't go that way, right? Like teams started with that, right? Uh, Katie, they started building their mini bots and then they, they found their, their ways through. Well, yeah, you know, you'd build this mini bot, they would just be heavy. They would be heavy and slow and teams are smart, so. They're like, okay, how can we make this not heavy? Well, let's ditch these wheels. We don't need four-inch wheels. This is ridiculous. Okay, well, um, the rules allowed us to... We didn't have to use Tetric Metal. We were allowed to use whatever metal we wanted. So I was like, okay, well, we're going to ditch that. We're going to go with aluminum, you know, as thin as we can use. Um, the poles were steel, so teams were like, all right, magnets, great. Uh, yeah, they just created this really interesting arms race. It's funny that, Peyton, you think, like, oh, it was a really nice thing. I hated the mini bot from the moment it came out. Um... <laughs> Because from my perspective, it's like, I have one robot to build. I don't want to build a second one. And I was on a small team, too. We didn't have the manpower to, like, build these robots. Um, and as some teams kind of noted, every minibot was a $79 iteration. Um, yeah. Because the, the motors would burn out really fast. Uh, you, it was about 50-50 with teams would use limit switches to turn off the motor. Because um, what some teams would do is they'd have a limit switch, so when the mo mini bot hit the top, it would stop. Other teams were just like, eh, it's seventy nine dollars, whatever. Right. Um, when you look at like I don't know the the not the curve of I'm not gonna say the curve of money, but like the the curve of resources spent to try to get the last tenths of seconds, like it you hit an asymptote very quickly. Of yes. Like both on you know burning motors out and such, but like teams are doing crazy stuff like running their motors in distilled water trying to you know clean the contacts uh, between the brush and the commutators and those motors like you know that's an old rc car trick um you know rc racing car trick that they're they're trying to get every ounce of performance in like overcharging batteries was a thing too like you would see some of these teams like running like 16 17 volts into these tetrix batteries and throwing them away after three matches because they you know they ate up all their capacity all kinds of stuff at the last like one percent of trying to get a faster mini bot and some of it, in hindsight, was for naught because you were, at that point, you were fighting the scan time of the PLC that actually governed the four minibot poles, where you were so close to everybody else that you might actually touch first, but you aren't seen first by the PLC itself. Like, that's crazy. Well, there's also kind of some of that F1, how fast can you react to the lights? There wasn't anything, there was no electronic indication of your minibot past that line at 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, that was governed by how how good can a ref see? Did your referee blink at the time that you were supposed to deploy? Yeah. Um, and I mean, off-seasons tried to solve it, and I don't know if they were any more effective even trying to use video replay, because it's like, how reactive is your driver's trigger finger? Um, I, say I know of at least one team that ended up getting their minibot disqualified at a state championship level in the finals, it, it deploys so close to the 10 second timer that uh, if a ref sees you deploy what they think is early, uh, it could be close enough that it, they just benefit, says your tower is disabled, no points. And that, that's really hard to gauge when everybody's chasing that last 1% to 
to make or break winning or being second or third. Yeah, and I yeah. think Minibot, we haven't seen an arms race like the Minibots. Uh, the only other one I can think of is the Can Grabbers. Like, that was, that's probably like one of the biggest arms races I've ever seen was the Minibots. Um, it did come with some cool, like, cool side effects of, you know, originally teams would just, like, stick the Minibot on the pole, and then eventually teams came up with these ramps so that they, you know, when the Minibots hit the pole, they were already at speed. Um, there were some really cool things. There were teams talking about, you know, the idea was the Minibot had to climb under its own power, and so teams were like, oh, well, what if we have a loop-de-loop in our robot so that by the time it, like, it goes up the loop and then down, and then when it hits the pole, it's even faster, you know. Minibots were wild. Yeah, they were. Yeah, I, I remember being on a on a team that cared to have a fast minibot, but we were, like, not interested in the ultra arms race um, because we wanted to, by the time we got to the championship, we wanted to be the team that was still scoring on the rack. There were, there were only, you know, two poles for three robots. Um, yeah. We wanted to be using our last, you know, 15 seconds or so um, to, to get the last tube or whatever to try to get that advantage and just be out of the way because we knew we didn't have the resources to you know, be a top 0.01% minibot. So we, we basically built something that we thought was going to be good enough for the majority of our matches to get to the champion. And I mean, that that mostly worked. But I mean, at the end of the day, my team was beat by minibots on Einstein <laughs> um, by just not having fast enough minibot. Well, so you had an interesting point about your minibot maneuver uh, in pre-show. Oh, right. Um, and like, we were, we were so obsessed with this last 15 seconds of the match even if we weren't going to be the minibot, or even if we were going to be the minibot at the pole or a person deploying the minibot, we spent an enormous amount of time practicing the last 15 seconds of the match where we would deploy minibot, retract our deployer, and try to get um, the last tube on the rack because we thought by the time, because um, we, we were a team that couldn't pick up off the floor. So our, our gameplay was, um, on, on 1503, was exactly the same every single match of drive the length of the field, grab a tube, bring it to the rack, score, repeat. Um, so we figured by the time we get to the championship, that would have been figured out by other teams and we'd actually see real defense. So we were obsessed with figuring out that we would get at most five tubes in teleop, trying to get the last logo, tube number six. We spent, you know, weeks practicing this maneuver of deploy, go score a tube. Um, and we totally missed the mark on the fact that the match ended um, if all four minibots were deployed, which they're at a higher likelihood of that happening at the championship. So when we practice this maneuver at uh, a regional like it, it's okay cool we can do this it you know it it doesn't be a thing and then we when we attempted to you know be that last 10 second robot and four minibots were scored at the championship we're like wait what what just happened um, so the the 2011 game was this interesting mix of like a callback of the you know a recent game of 2007 which we just talked about in session two um but the this new thing of deploying like new in the sense of deploying a completely separate robot we saw a little bit in 2002. Uh, we saw some teams have a tethered little robot um, for, you know, for zone zeal. Um, other teams use a tape measure, so it wasn't like widespread people did that. Um, but it was like the first time we'd seen this new, like, put robot somewhere and separate, you know, whole robot does a thing. That was really interesting, right? I mean, a lot of teams put a lot of their stock and season into, all right, how do we make 2007 robots better? Great. Let's put that in the bag. All right, how do we minibot? <laughs> Happened for a lot of teams that stopped build there. Right, Peyton? Yeah, and I think one of the interesting things is, especially at the, the earlier events, uh, we saw a lot of robots that could only deploy a minibot, and they were very successful in both winning matches to, to rank high and captaining alliances deep into eliminations because they, they looked through the rules, they saw what points were available for what kind of actions, and they focused almost entirely on how can I consistently put this little robot onto a pole every single time and there's their rankings and uh outcomes kind of showed what looking through the rules and seeing what the point values are and how much effort some of these challenges might be yeah we saw the pink team down in florida like that's how they really got through their first event they they had like one of the best robots in 2007 you know the the pink arm telescoping arm whatever roller claw like they made the roller claw, claw cool in 2007 they barely scored tubes in their first event, but they had a very fast, very consistent minibot, and that's how they won. Um, like that's kind of kind of nutty, where they were okay with you know waiting or you know working through the bugs on their main robot, um, and just like kind of not not riding the coattails isn't the right word, but like you know riding the success of their their minibot there. 
Well, and it's funny, I don't think the GDC did this on purpose, but there was a red herring of everyone focused on the tubes because that was what the game was presented as, was to focus on the tubes. You know, if I, as an adult now, had, like, done a rule game analysis on that, immediately it would have been, like, you mean this one-time action is 30 points and I have to do six actions to get, like, 24 points? Well, yeah, no, I'm gonna do that one time. Like, it's wild because if I did it now, it'd be, like, Minibot is number one, 100% the most important thing. If you can make a, like, especially you have to think, like, teams are going to fall for this red herring. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we've, we've all had years of experience of sorting out these objectives in games, and, like, now it's so obvious, right? Like, especially, yeah. like, you look at, like, it's, like, number one priority for Steamworks, and number one priority <laughs> for, like, most of these, you know, slimy tasks, because they're so valuable. Yeah. So, like, 2011, again, feels like it's a simple game, right? There's only a few things that you really had to do. Um, but I want to talk about our last our, our last game in the segment that's 2012 which is rebound rumble um and this game itself is unique because it's the first game designed mostly by an internal crew of of first employees like first engineering staff 2011 was the last like real external game where there were a lot of people who aren't on first payroll um 2012 um is the first internal frc engineering game katie it was robot basketball right but there was a whole lot more to it so yeah you had these foam basketballs you had four hoops, one ho high hoop that was worth three points, two middle hoops that were worth two points, and a low hoop that was worth one point. Uh, the way they had set up the height rules and the hoops was really interesting in that you could just dump into a one-point hoop, and you could do a very, very simple lob into a two-point hoop. Um, under the hoops was a base that meant that you could not, like, touch the hoops. So they also had some basketball rules. They had, like, a key... Um, they had, they didn't have a three-point zone, but they had, you know, the key, and you can only be in the key for so long. They had the free-throw line, uh, which was a protected zone. And then the other part of the game is they had these bridges. So the field was divided into two by a three-inch tall, three-inch wide, you know, steel barrier. So if you just wanted to yeet your way across it, you totally could. But if you wanted a little bit more simpler, you had three bridges, and these bridges were naturally balanced, and then you could tilt them side to side, and that was how most teams would traverse the field. Isn't that quite as rough on your on your wheels? Um, and so the main game was scoring these basketballs. You got bonus points for scoring an auton. And then the end game was balancing on the bridges. So this is the first year that we see cooperation um, bonus. Uh, what teams found is, so if you balance with one other robot on your team's bridge, you got like 20 points. Um, if you balanced on the middle bridge with a team from the other alliance, you would get, it's like a bonus ranking point. Mm-hmm. This was like one of the first years of bonus RPs. And then during ELIMS, there's no cooperation because it's ELIMS, you know, fight till the death. Uh, and so you would see teams trying to do a triple balance on their team's bridges. And these bridges were not designed for three robots. They were not wide enough. And that created some really fun buzzer beater moments. Yeah, definitely. The, um, the, the bridges, like, looking at the field design, Peyton, one of the things we've talked about in our previous sessions is where scoring happens if it's all centered or at the ends changes the audience perspective, right? And we had we had both in this game, right? We had um, having to have you know split eyes to watch both sides score at the ends, but the you know the exciting part happens in the center of the field, right? Everybody kind of remembers the end because it's very exciting. But like you were saying, yeah, with with both teams kind of scoring on their respective halves into the hoops, and most people kind of see that as the primary objective. Uh, it's very exciting. It, just about any projectile game, watching teams be able to sink threes from uh, 15 to 20 feet away is uh, very exciting. But then the the dynamic change at the last 30 to 40 seconds is incredibly powerful, where you get this choo-choo train of robots trying to one by one by one push themselves up a bridge that they're way too big to fit on. And I, I think really because uh, it was an end game where you didn't know the status of whether it would count or not until the last second when the buzzer went off. And so I think when people say buzzer beater, that this is probably one of the bigger noticing factors of buzzer beating, because at the very last second, a, a team could shift just the wrong way and the whole bridge could tip over and robots could fall over. And it was, it was very exciting. I think the biggest dynamic with the bridge is... Uh, whether you went for two, because the way the point scoring for it was, it was 10 points per robot. But if you got a third robot, it was an additional 20 points. 
So uh, when a game piece is only worth three points a piece, that's essentially seven high goals for one additional robot. And so it was very enticing for teams to try to chance their luck on getting three robots to fit on a bridge uh, versus two robots and a, an additional shooter. Uh, I know our alliance uh, at most of our events picked not because of teams' ability to shoot the basketballs, but whether they were complementary in size to our own robot to fit uh, for the eliminations matches. And that's a that's an interesting aspect in that you're picking robots for things that they didn't necessarily need to do during all of qualification matches. Yeah, that's totally weird because like there there was no bonus point for doing the triple balance in quals, right? Like it was twenty twenty or twenty, and you were you were far more advantageous it was far more advantageous to get the cooperation bonus of, of balancing two opposing robots on that center bridge because it was worth effectively an extra match win which is the first time we had seen you know a cooperation task in a, a very long time that was two robots like yes in 2011 we had the cooperation award of sharing your mini bot around uh, for other teams but like this is like the first time where you had opposing robots trying to collectively do something that was intentional in the game right katie yeah, I mean, it was a really cool dynamic that unfortunately got abused at some events. But, you know, it was neat because then, you know, normally your pre-match strategy is talking to your alliance partners and saying, like, okay, what can you do? What can we do? Where do we want to start? Who plays defense? Um, but now your pre-match strategy involves, like, okay, who's going to balance with the other team? And then go finding the other team and saying, like, okay, who's going to balance on your team? Um, it created this really interesting thing that, you know, I think first really likes of working with your opponents. Um, because now it's not working with the opponents out of the goodness of your heart. It's working with the opponents out of like a need to get the ranking point. I mean, we, we see at some events that teams would snub, you know, the good teams because, you know, pettiness or whatever, and they were willing to sacrifice the ranking point because they wanted the other team to be kind of torpedoed. Um, and I have a feeling that's why we don't see this kind of cooperation like later on, but I thought it was a really cool thing. You know, it gave both alliances incentive to work together. You know, we're not battle bots anyways, but this added to that of like, we don't, we want our opponents to be, if all three of your opponents weren't working, you know, there's no guarantee that you can get the competition bonus because they might go for that 20 points on their bridge. Um, so it gave, you know, every, it increased the incentive for all six robots to be playing and to be playing at a reasonable capacity. Hi, kitty. <laughs> Simon's joining us as well. Special guest, Simon, do you have anything uh, to say about the 2012 game? No. He wasn't alive for that game. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> so that year, wasn't there a rule about extensions where you could only extend about 12 inches from like a single direction of your robot at a time? Yeah, there was a rule that year uh, stating that you could only have one extension outside of your robot at a time. And it brought up a ambiguous definition of the rule on if you had multiple things that moved out of your robot at the same time, uh, but they weren't attached at the end, does that count as one appendage or not? Uh, and it wasn't until pretty late into the season when it was finally clarified what the ruling on that would be. So some of the, uh, so a lot of the teams didn't necessarily use their appendages for shooting purposes, but um, they were helpful with balancing the bridges. Well, it was also, it was getting on the bridges for one because they were neutrally balanced. So you had to tip them before you could even go on them. Um, and a lot of teams had a passive like ramp that they would just use. Um, but yeah, then we had the stinger, uh, which was the most effective method of, um, you know, trying to fit three robots on this bridge and balance the bridge. Uh, we saw the failed methods of, so the GDC had very explicit rules about what was, what constituted being on the bridge. Um, and then what constituted, like, what parts of the bridge you could interact with. You know, teams were like, well, what if we hang off the side of the bridge? And they're like, no, that's not allowed. You have to be reacting with the top of the bridge. Um, and so we had 179 who had this, like, it basically attached to the very end of the lip, only reacting to the top surface. Um, but the idea was to create more space so you could fit all three robots. Uh, then you had geniuses like 3928, which is my team, mm -hmm. who... Uh, one of the clarifications well, was, well, what is the bridge? And they said, the bridge is this drawing. Under the bridges were these little plastic ball deflectors. I, I really hope we weren't the only team who had the idea, and I hope we were the only ones stupid enough to try it. These ball deflectors were constituted as part of the bridge. 
to be balanced on the bridge, you had to be supported by the bridge. And then there were some things about, like, reacting against the top surface or whatever. So we thought, well, the ball deflector is technically part of the bridge, as per this Q&A. So what if we build a 7-inch tall robot that sits on the ball deflector so that the bridge, we can put two people on top of the bridge? Um, I mean, we effectively would act as a stinger. So anyways, uh, we saw the stinger, which was a fun... Um, I, I don't know if the GDC expected the stingers to exist. So the stingers, what they were, was like a piston, basically, that would come out of the bottom of a robot to contact the ground to hold the bridge level while the three robots, like, sorted themselves out. Because a lot of times when you're trying to balance, you'd see teams overcorrecting. And so this helped with the overcorrecting because they didn't have to move enough to get the bridge to move. They just had to move enough to be in the right spot. Yeah, it helped break the momentum as well um, of, you know, the mass of three robots. It, it helped break that really quickly. Yeah, I there was a lot of Q&A aru about what was a bridge and what was not a bridge and what was supported and, and such. There was... Multiple teams had many creative um, implementations of, you know, trying to make space, um, trying to solve the problem of this is a four by eight sheet of HDPE making the surface. Robots were still big back then. We still had, you know, 28 by 38 max size robots. You know, the team neutrinos, you know, under the bridge, you know, super cute little robot um, that, you know, rug got pulled out from under you on that one. Um, that was our own fault. We didn't ask. That's, that's fair. Um, but like there was... There was almost this standoff isn't the right word, right? But there was this like game of chicken between 118 and the GDC because 118 had a side hanger that um, would grab the little metal lip, um, and this is where the top surface rule kind of came in. Um, yes, they had a, a a device that was passive in the sense of it would hook on the side, right, Peyton? Yeah. So. 118's device was definitely a hot take, especially because they went to a very early event that year. And essentially, it was kind of like a piece of angle that would hang off of the angle of the bridge. And then they could use it to drive side to side to help balance the bridge out. And so based on their interpretation of we are passive, you could completely take the robot off the bridge without leaving any marks or without having to enable the system. Uh, as well as we are balanced by the bridge. And so I think they were able to make one practice match before the, the event got a phone call from first saying uh, that's not legal. And there was a subsequent game update, essentially to the effect of finding grasping, grappling, and attaching, which uh, put in these caveats saying you really couldn't like physically hold on to the bridge. And those rules kind of carry over to even now. Right. And that's like another example of this period where the game design committees were really trying to keep a close handle on exactly how their games were played. Right. There's a there's good motivation, Katie, for first to care about this because yeah. they really care about what product they are delivering both to, you know, random person off the street, but also all of their donors, sponsors and, you know, everybody in the tent. Right. I not like you can't fault them go. for wanting things to be the way one. they are. Right. Um, and I mean, like, even as a participant, sometimes I get frustrated when teams are, like, clearly trying to play the game in a way the game's not supposed to be played. But you also can't fault those teams because, like, they're trying to find the advantages of the system. I feel like this is, 2012 is probably one of the, 2012, 2010-ish, is when you start to hear people really grumbling about lawyering the rules. What is a bridge was a huge pain point in the community. Because you have this group of people who are strongly like, guys, the goal is to balance on the bridge. Like, let's knock it off. And you have this group of people who are like, well, yeah, but this is so many points that, like, of course, we're going to put all of our energy into you know, solving this problem as most effectively as we can. Um, I mean, first got their way in the end. The closest we came to a robot that was, like, edging the rules was uh, 179. You know, we had Swamp Thing, and they would hang off that very edge lip. Uh, but that didn't even work out that well for them because their center, the set, like the center of balance, was so far over that it was hard to balance with them. One one pain point that I remember um, that is a, a thing for teams to really consider when designing their games is the difference of what a real field element acts like versus what a home build version or what like you could remotely build um as a you know an average team Peyton. like the the bridges are totally different on the team version versus the real build, right yeah so the the team build version 
was very uh, similar to what we'd see now for Tim team build versions of stuff. It was this is the general dimensions of the bridge, and here is the plywood drawing of each of those components, which, uh, when teams made those, made bridges that were able to be tipped in one direction or the other incredibly easy with very little effort. And I think that lulled a lot of teams, my, my own included, into a false sense of our robot will work when we get to a competition. And then we got to the competition and the real field elements were vastly different uh, in performance than the one we had made at home, rendering a decent function of our robot uh, inoperable. Uh, later on in the season, they did have to put in some additional clarification on uh, specifications to tune your home build versions to better uh, match what you would see when you got to a competition. And and you got to be super careful um, when you're designing a game like that because, um, like like Katie, um, the, you can inadvertently create a um, a disparity of the haves and have-nots, right? Yeah, I mean, my team built it out of plywood. The way we tried to get the correct dynamics was nailing like free weights to the bottom of the bridge typically the way bridges in any event are described is like if you put three pounds from a foot from the edge it should fall in five seconds three seconds however many seconds um you can do that you can still end with like a, the, the wrong bridge you know um i was in charge of like our bridge construction that year and it went really poorly you know we had the luck that we were able to go to a preseason event uh the week zero and that was when we found out everything was broken anyways. But, you know, if we had gone to an event with what we had made on our home version, this is why you saw so many teams that year with arms that couldn't move the bridge. You know, they'd, they'd, they'd be like, dink, 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 and the, the bridge wouldn't move anywhere. And it wasn't their fault. It was just that the real version and the home version were so different. And and this extended to the, the goals too, right? It's weird to think about it, but the from what I remember, Peyton, the, the surface of uh, you know the the polycarb that was the backboard of the baskets if you were building a backspin style shooter behaved very differently than the plywood versions because the plywood version was a lot slipperier its margin of error was totally different right yeah and i think that's uh in in fact heightened by two different factors on why scoring in the basket was challenging you have the surface of the backboard being different which when you're basing a lot of your testing based off of what you do at home uh you can see great differences on the actual field and the other portion that i don't think anyone at first intended was uh the basketballs themselves that we were using was a very inconsistent game piece based even batch to batch uh so making teams have to learn as they go uh quite a bit uh whether they should apply more compression or less compression or no compression and this was even heightened when teams made it to eliminations because in eliminations, they recycled all the balls out and brought out all new balls. So teams that had spent a, a decent majority of their event tuning in and finally getting things just right to work uh, were kind of left in the dust. And like that's that's a tough balance for first, right? Because they they both, A, want their playoffs to look good. This is in no order, by the way. They want the playoffs to look good, right? I mean, this is the big show. But also, um, as we've discovered in later games, like you think – that a new game piece, especially in foam ball world game pieces, a new game piece is going to behave more consistently than a game piece full of holes. Didn't work out so well for um, these game pieces where two halves would be two different densities, but you, you think you're doing a service by providing something that is a known point, right? Um, but sometimes it can kind of get turned upside down and then you've got teams like trying to do things like manipulate the game pieces, like stomping on them before they put them in their <laughs> robot um, so that they are more like what they've been used to for the last three days of the event. Yeah. And I think it's very difficult overall. I mean, even 2010 where, you know, the game piece was supposed to be, you know, the standard soccer ball. Um, we found out that there is no real standard soccer ball, um, especially when we're, you know, super critically engineering everything down to the surface texture and, you know exactly what size it is and shape and, and all those tiny little details that uh typically a foam ball manufacturer doesn't really need to care about right um we're on the game piece train there's one thing that first has really learned in the last you know you know decade or so that we're talking about a game design is controlling the game piece supply we we didn't talk about yet about lunacy is that 
um, when when the game got basically shipped of like, yep, here's the game, we're done, here's the game piece, let's buy all the game pieces, so he's talking about, you know, the, the Orbit Balls, um, that was a discontinued product by the time kickoff came around in a very short manner of first is like, yep, commit, we're going to make these, um, and then they all got discontinued. Um, the intent that first had, along with, you know, the soccer ball, was to, you could get these game pieces at your local Walmart, right? Yeah, and then it went, it was chaos, you know, again, have versus have nots. You know, first it's gotten a lot better about balancing those types of things, but that was the year of, do you have a parent who can drive to every Walmart in a hundred mile radius? Because you can only get one or two at any Walmart, you know, great. Um, eventually teams figured out, and they were super fragile. That was the other thing is when you're, you know, building your prototypes, you could break three in one prototype. Yep. Um, eventually teams kind of figured out how to make an at-home version, and it was close, but it was still a lot of work. It was still, you know, not the same. I think 2009 was a huge, everyone was mad because they were like, well, why didn't first tell the company that they were going to do this? And, you know, the GDC wants to keep their game a secret. There's thousands upon thousands of people who want to know what this thing is. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I worked at Vex, no one knew the Vex game until it was released outside of the GDC because it was that important to keep it a secret. Right. And first is going to be the same way. This is their, this is their product. Mm -hmm. And um, like, there's, there's all kinds of reasons. Um, like keeping, keeping it a secret is, is probably the, like the biggest one. Kids are smart, right? The, the teams are smart. Yeah. They can find stuff like this happening. Like when um, an object, like, for example, like teams even will build series of like when a, a game piece object that has existed in the past for like a first tech challenge game goes out of stock on like the Animark website, they go, oh, wait a minute, maybe this is the new game piece. Um, like teams are really smart and they watch these things. There's, there's not only the secrecy part, right? But there's also um, just from a business perspective, and this is a thing, you know, when you're thinking about your own game design stuff, is cash flow right um yeah. a, a game piece you are buying from a retailer is going to be a, a lot more expensive when you're buying en masse from a retailer it's gonna be a lot more expensive than like going and making your own um or finding like the root manufacturer of a game piece so while custom game pieces like are really cool um sometimes they can be cheaper um when you're designing your own game elements game elements like going to your local you know say walmart or you know uh, department store um you have to think like kind of like big macro scale of okay, I'm designing a game and now I have to buy, you know, 10,000 orange basketballs. Um, that scales very, very fast. Um, and, you know, it's a hard balance, right? You want something that is like valuable to the teams, durable to send to the gameplay and available, whether or not you as, uh, you know, your game designer decide to put, you know, them in the kit of parts, whatever, um, or ensure they're available to teams. That's really tough, especially when you're working in, in time limits of making a game exist. Um, and that's something First has gotten a lot better at is now they, you know, work with their suppliers to get these game pieces, you know, basically in-house. You know, after the lunacy fiasco, you know, soccer balls are like, what's more common than a soccer ball? It's, you know, the world's favorite sport. Yeah, in 2011, they were custom. Um, I think from 2011 on, they've all been custom. Frisbees were, were Frisbees. So again, a very common thing. Um, much like soccer balls, you think there's a standard frisbee and there isn't. Uh, but yeah, they like really improved on that. And mm -hmm. if you can't find something common like a soccer ball, you know, owning the supply chain and like the gears are a great example of they're a really cool, unique game piece. Um, and they're not expensive to make because they're injection molded plastic. Um, and you don't have to worry about tolerances. Right. And and first, you know, they used to work on a year to year cycle of like they'd start a game, especially in, you know, the, the period of time we're talking about, they start a game like right around the championship and have it ready to go ship out like November or so and work on sourcing then. Um, but they work so far ahead now as lessons from, you know, these game piece sourcing issues, they work so far ahead so that they have both time and like can spread out the capital purchases to make sure they have these game pieces and can actually find good solutions it gives them time to make changes too, right? Like if they, they've identified a game piece that, oh, we want a, you know, you know, like six, seven inch foam ball. Um, it gives them time to explore all their sourcing options instead of we prototype with this one, we need to find this one. Yeah, one of the, just to change topics, I think one of the other things we haven't talked about with the 2012 game is the um, unique uh, autonomous mode portion of 
uh, the match. And Peyton, I see you laughing a little bit. I just want us to insert the video of the cheesy poof auto at champs. <laughs> um, but Peyton, can maybe you can explain exactly how the intent was for this technology to work and what it, what exactly it was. So 2012 brought us a, an interesting game mechanic called the hybrid mode. And the hybrid mode took place during the normal autonomous mode. Uh, and off to the side of the field, um, there was a Microsoft Connect, which uh, was provided in everybody's kit of parts to test with, which was an interesting uh, technology uh, where it could track your emotions. And then you could essentially map those motions to actions that your robot could complete during the hybrid mode. And so the intent was that uh, one member of either alliance could use this hybrid mode to essentially control their robot during when normal teams would be using an autonomous kind of period. And there was a few teams that were very successful in using this mode uh, in place of an auto mode. But one of the hidden benefits of the hybrid mode is there is only one portion of the driver station in which uh, a team could use the uh, hybrid version using the connect. And so teams uh, got very clever and if they wanted the middle zone uh, to play the match in, they would say, we are the uh, connect team for our alliance. So they would get the middle station, which had generally the best view of the entire field. And so it's interesting kind of seeing that develop off of uh, a game mode that uh, generally wasn't widely adopted by teams, but became very strategic to uh, a certain level of teams where they is like, oh, we can get preferential uh, driver station placement. Yeah, definitely. But you know, it's, it, I'm glad you brought that up because, like, I I once again assume that was not the intent at all of the the game design committee because they had to pick like you know a station to get it to be useful with the technology at the time, right? You know, see, the, on the flip side, I could see the GDC maybe you know when you're when you're designing a game, it's about your carrots and your sticks. So, like, your sticks are almost always penalties. So, in the case of the Connect, that was a partnership with Microsoft. You know, you don't typically get a bunch of Connects donated for nothing. Right. So, it was, like, a partnership with Microsoft. And, you know, again, like, First has this product. So, they want teams to be using this, this technology. And so, what's a great way to incentivize a team to do something than saying, like, hey, look at the best seat in the house. Yeah. You know, it could have been accidental. Or, like, let's give the GDC some credit. That could have been entirely on purpose of, like, okay, we have this thing. We want Microsoft to like see kids doing cool stuff. And I think another fun bonus to the Connect in terms of that year is the opportunities that opened up teams to more advanced programming, uh, both for the hybrid period. And I, I know plenty of teams that instead of using the Connect to drive their robot, they supplemented the robot's abilities on the field using the advanced sensor that is the Connect. Using it for, you know, game piece navigation and finding um, was like a thing that became a lot more accessible in 2012 before we had, you know, these um, you know, smaller and more marketplace um, driven like vision systems that exist in the marketplace now. That was like the first thing that was within reach that was usable for teams. I was just um, thinking it's wild how hard vision was. Yeah, because you know, vision got somewhat solved with the pixie cam, um, which did a lot of the color tracking for you, and then the pixie cam got obliterated with the limelight. Right. And so you like look back; they had the the square on the backboard was you know a vision target, but vision was so hard. You know, no one. I mean, people used vision, but the average team did not use vision the way the average team can use vision now. Mm hmm. And the persistence of an advantage of using vision in so many games, like 2011 is the first time we had retroreflective tape be on the field. I mean, most people don't remember it, but it was all over the rack. There were little pieces of it on the rack mm -hmm. so you could see it. We also had the lines for, uh, so you could like line follow like an FLL robot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the persistence of, you know, retroreflective targets has kind of driven the, like, obviously there's been an advantage, right, for the teams who have it. And it's driven the floor up over over time from you know forcing these products to become like oh duh it makes sense to have something that i can see that retroreflective target really well and it's just totally raised the floor of um you know the semi-autonomous or full autonomous parts of, of games for all teams 
that that that's our last game but there's um there you know there's so much more we could say about individual games but the pathway we've taken through you know watching how trying to pick apart where the the game design committee was uh through this games is is, is fun right there's a few common themes though like like a lot of these games there's a lot of you know heavy handedness that we've talked about right yeah we've seen the gdc trying to steer they wanted the slow robots in 2009 with the hard wheels and the hard plastic um, in 2010, we saw them really try to kind of push this passing mechanism that didn't quite come to play. But, you know, they were clearly trying to divide the field. Those bumps were impossible to get over. And those tunnels were so tiny and so narrow that, you know, to build a robot that small, especially back then, that could also play the game was hard. And then we go to 2011, where, like, the minibot had so many rules. Um, I mean, even telling us where to place, lo- like, the tubes to make these logos... First has learned a lot about how to get the game they want while with without having to have very prescriptive rules. Yeah, Peyton, like we're gonna we're gonna find out in some of our, our sessions four and five as a little bit of a preview, right? As Katie said, they've they've learned a lot, right? I mean the, the old way in old games is to, you know, solve it with rules, just like have a concept that's very simple, um, and then put a bunch of, you know, patches over it to try to close holes. But now they've 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 kind of learned and solved it with either strategic or even physical, uh, strategic incentives are like physical um, things on the field, right? Yeah, I, I definitely will have to agree that the this period, uh, it's a lot of structured, um, you, you put something in, you get something out, and everything is kind of a known quantity. Uh, leading up into the future, uh, I'm sure we'll find out that the game is kind of more of a starting place for teams and there's a lot more open-ended challenges to solve that lead to some really creative uh, mechanisms and ideologies on how to complete a task that if we were still in like this period would be very boxed in based on the rulings for uh, everything. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, that brings us to the end of our show for uh, session three. Um, on behalf of Liz and myself, I really want to thank uh, both Peyton and Katie for uh, joining us for uh, episode three of our uh, game design history of game design show here uh, presented by uh, First Indiana Robotics. It's an absolute blast. Um, I enjoy always talking to you guys at events. Um, I hope we get to do that in person soon in the next calendar year or so, for sure. Fingers crossed. Uh, on behalf of um, our AV crew, specifically, you know, Brad Thompson for making all of this uh, meet together, and uh, Matt Malinak for um, really leading this project. Um, being like the director behind the scenes. Definitely thank you all for, as the audience, for tuning in to our our broadcast today as well. Um, We had a total blast, and uh, we look forward to seeing you for uh, episodes four and five. Hey, everybody, and welcome to our live Q&A portion here on the first Indiana Robotics Twitch channel once again. Hope you guys enjoyed um, what we've talked about so far, you know, games 2009 to 2012 here. Uh, Very happy to see that both Peyton and Katie were available to uh, join us again for tonight as well as Liz um, for us to answer some uh, some of your fun questions from chat. Um, A lot of these questions are actually pretty good. Um, Excited to hear what y'all's answers are uh, on these, and let's jump right into them. First one is a uh, real hard one. Uh, Katie, I'm going to go with you first on this one. What is your favorite game and why? My favorite game is 2005. And honestly, it's probably because it's the first game I ever saw. Uh, but I also really liked the strategy of tic-tac-toe, but make it tall. Seems reasonable. Peyton, what about you? Uh, I'd say probably 2013 with Ultimate Ascent. Is this such a fast-paced game? And with the advent of Robot in Three Days, you could see a lot of lower resource teams be a really good robot for any alliance kind of thing. Seems reasonable. Mm-hmm. Okay, a couple, couple easier ones. Peyton, what is the best field shape? Field shape? Uh, it's hard to say. There's some really good ones from some of the uh, other sessions, but I'd say probably just the normal rectangle because it's pretty simple. 
Seems reasonable. Katie? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with rectangle. Easiest to reproduce. Okay. I like to have a meme answer of hexagons are the best agons. I'm a big CGPA <laughs> fan, so um, I like to pull that one out. But also, I agree that just rectangles are the nicest, the easiest yeah. to set up, easiest to measure out as an FCA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah those nice right angles help. Right. Okay. So you, you both said a couple favorite games, but if you could replay any game, uh, Katie, we'll start with you on this one. If you could replay any game with modern robot rules, you know, 2020 or 2021 robot rules, which game would it be and why? 2000, I just want to play 2005. I didn't get to play it, so I want to play it. Alternatively, because I didn't get to play it, 2020. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Peyton, what do you think? I also would have liked the opportunity to play 2020, but uh, I think probably 2000 uh, co-op partition first. There's just so many different things that robots could do so this yeah. is a nice little challenge. Yeah, all the, the de-scoring and like live robot action over the, at the trough would have been really interesting to see with modern robot rules. Liz, what do you think? Mm, I don't know. Um, I, uh, I always said 2005 would be interesting to replay just because the robots are so different now. But I think we'd have to really uh, put up some safety rules or something Yeah, <laughs> with uh, all the drivetrain power and everything going on with that. Right. I like to say, even though not everybody is like a huge fan of this game, I like to say 2010. And the reason why is I don't think the robot rules and the tech we had at the time really did that game justice. I think the game was pretty underplayed where like kicking and controlling game piece was pretty hard because like the advent of a roller pinchy thing mm -hmm. was still kind of new to a lot of teams. Um, in 2010. And I'd like to see that game played maybe without, I don't know, dogma, all of that, um, played uh, with modern robot rules personally. Yeah. And I think a lot of teams would want the chance to do that, those mechanisms again, one more time. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can prove that maybe vacuums <laughs> were or were not the answer right. <laughs> um, for that game. Okay. Um, still going on the favorites train here. Um, Peyton, what is your favorite end game of all FRC games so far? Oh, that's that's pretty easy. My favorite end game is definitely the bridge balancing. It's just so uh, dynamic and down to the wire on whether it succeeds or fails. Reasonable, Katie. So he said bridge balancing, so I won't say bridge balancing, even though like excellent mechanic. Uh, the pyramid, it was so dumb. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. I. I like the pyramid too because it was just so different, right? Like it's climbing, but it's also climbing on top of climbing. Like Yo Dog, I heard you like climbing. I I, I agree. I like that one. Um, okay, so uh, speaking of end games, um, one of the I don't know controversial end games we covered in this game were were the mini bot towers, right? And we talked a little bit about how it's a bit of an arms arms race where you know started getting some diminishing returns and such. Um, would you? Would either of you, Peyton? I'll start with you. Would you bring back this challenge and what changes would you make to the mini bot race? I don't know. That's, that's a hard one. I wasn't a huge fan of the mini bots in the first place, especially by the time you look at like worlds where all the mini bots were the same and they're nothing like what you thought a mini bot would be. It was just motors, wheels, and a battery kind of thing. So probably wouldn't want to bring it back. But if I did, I would say you probably put more emphasis on like the components that are required for a mini bot. So you see maybe a more smart mini bot kind of thing. Maybe not climbing a pole, but maneuvering a maze or something. That'd be pretty neat. Katie, do you have an opinion here? No mini bots. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's totally fair. I remember like on, on bag day or ship day, um, like there is no mini bot stuff on a robot at all. <laughs> like we were like, uh, we're saving this for later. I remember that. Um, okay, so let's talk about rank points, right? They start to we start to see ranking points become a thing in this in this session, and a lot more in episodes four and five. Um, Katie, are they a good thing? Um, and are there different changes you might make to them? For ranking, are they a good? What, what's the alternative? Like, I mean, we could just do you know we we've gone win loss tie with like sums of scores in the past. Mm. Um, We've done average score as well in an upcoming session um, of your own score for a, a non win loss tie game. Like, I our, really our... like the current ranking point system uh, with the bonus ranking points for like in game tasks. I think it really helps solve a lot of the problems that we were seeing 
you know, back in the day of like unqualified teams with a good schedule, like ranking really high and it kind of, especially the more complicated tasks require, uh, they just make it harder for bad teams to seed high. So I like it. Uh, I don't know how I would tweak it. I, I'm not one of those people that runs models on events to see like how we could better run them. That's fair. Peyton, what do you think? I, I really do enjoy the current ranking system because it, it makes it so even if you have a poor match setup uh, with your opponents and partners, you can still uh, keep yourself up in the rankings. And also with the, the way the current way is, you have the ability to play portions of the game that are somewhat different. So it allows teams to either specialize in specific fields, but also make portions of the game interesting for different teams. That's fair. I, I agree with both of you. I think they're really, really good. And it's taken us a while to get there, right? I, but I, I, I do really like the, um, the, the use of, you know, objective-based, but also, you know, match-based ranking points a lot. Um, okay, so there's a lot of favorite questions. Like, that's like an easy question to ask, right? So, um, Katie, do you have a favorite mechanism that has ever been on an FRC robot? Uh... I think the, I was a huge fan of the post buzzer ascensions in 2010, uh, namely like 1625. Cause that was the one, like that was my local team. I'm going to go with that. That's going to be my favorite. I like those a lot too. Peyton, do you? Uh, it seems kind of like a cop-out answer, but like the whole redirector from 469 in 2010, it, it's like the thought of something being so simple, but also being so effective in game breaking is it's a really neat mechanism. Also the Simbots Climber in 2013. I totally agree with that one. That one blew my brain when I saw it. Liz, was that going to be your answer? No, I was thinking of, uh, along the lines of 2010, uh, the Simbots 2010 Climber. I think I was on a team that um, just chose to kind of do the standard hook and winch on the horizontal bar and just to see so many teams grab the vertical bar and successfully um, do like a, a fold up on that was like, oh, duh, like why what didn't we think about that? <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a tough time with, with this one um, between two really good thoughtful mechanisms from 2017 about gears. Both 610 and 1018 had really put a lot of thought into what is the gear going to be like when I get to the pay. And 610s was super advanced in the sense that it had a bunch of brake beam sensors pointing down that would detect the peg and it would shift the gear left or right based on where it saw the peg was and you know eject it on that way. 1018s was a bit simpler where they dropped the gear in their slot and there was a mating like routed or printed, I'm not really sure, gear, the same pitch that would rotate it such that a cavity was pointing up all the time. And I was like, well, that's super freaking cool. Like, <laughs> I feel dumb for not thinking about that. Just to, you know, noting, knowing that getting the, the gear on the peg was actually pretty difficult. And they thought of that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, looking through some of these questions, we are going to go a little bit past nine here because there's a lot of questions here. Um, we know this, the uh, previous section was a little bit longer. Um, okay. This is, this is a fun, silly one. I'll start with Peyton and I'll ask it in a silly voice. What game piece would you be and why? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, I don't know, probably uh, a tote from uh, Recycle Rush because like versatility, man. It's like, not only is it a game piece, but we use those things for travel everywhere we go and in our shop. So definitely reusable kind of thing, so. That's fair. Katie? I'm gonna say an orbit ball. Rare, easy to break, uh, really unpredictable, <laughs> unreliable. I like that one. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Liz, do you have an answer? I do answer? not have an answer. What is your <laughs> I, I, I don't have an answer <laughs> for this one, except maybe being a uh, recycling container. I, I'm stealing this answer, being a recycling container, because sometimes <laughs> I just feel like trash. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay. Um, this is a really open-ended question, Katie. Um, what do you think of the games that you know you you know about or you know are an expert in? 
what do you think is the most complex game we've had so far? Not having not played 2020, I think 2020, the whole like series of events was very complicated. And so that would probably be up there. Um, I mean, fortunately, FRC is an FTC because all of those games are complex. So That's I'm going to go, but I haven't played 2020. And I think I've heard that like in actually playing it 2020, like no one actually did any of that stuff. So. That's fair. I'll go with 2020. Peyton? Yeah, I, I think I share similar sentiments. Uh, for the games that I did play, I think 2018 has a lot of uh, depth when it comes to strategy and like when to play power-ups and which power-ups to play first and when to give up on a losing scale and when to go for the other team's switch. So there's a lot of dynamics that like make it pretty complicated to like even a viewer just, just trying to see what's going on. So that's my answer. It's fair. Okay, so one of the games covered in this section was, you know, 2009 Lunacy. Um, and one of the maybe controversial things about that game we covered would be all of, the, all of the robots had to use the exact same wheel. They could use any number of them, but they had to be, you know, not super scored up. They had to be, you know, as cots as you could get, right? And that was kind of controversial, where there's one mechanical aspect of the robot that put everybody in the same kind of playing field. Um, Katie, do you think that this is a, a thing that maybe we should see again in the future where there's some kind of big playing field leveler or are we, are we kind of past that? I, I think we're past that. I think uh, that was a great exercise and like, how can you lawyer the rules and how can you, like the conversation we had earlier, like how much can you beat up your wheel before it's not the same wheel? Uh, I do think it'd be fun to see 2009 played on a normal field with like whatever wheels you want and shopping cart casters on the trailers. Uh, other people don't like that idea because they think high-speed ramming would be like a problem, but I think that'd be super rad. I think that'd be fun. I hope the trailers would survive. Peyton, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, that, that'd definitely be interesting. Um, I think one of the neat things about that is since most teams probably ran a very simple drivetrain in 2009 because you weren't looking for a whole lot of pushing power in your drivetrain or a whole lot of additional maneuverability because you just slip. That it probably put teams on a path to focus more on game piece manipulation and scoring, which is something that generally, depending on where you're focused on, doesn't get as much attention if you're focusing a lot of your attention on pushing or maneuverability in other fields. So, very, very true points there. Um, one question that we've asked just about, you know, all of our, our, our guests so far, um, and I'm going to iterate it a little bit, um, is about things you want to see. Uh, and Peyton, I'll throw this one to you first. Um, what either game piece or like robot challenge do you want to see in a future game? As awful as it would be for field reset, I do like the idea of like, something small like a racquetball kind of just littering a specific maybe just a specific spot on the field that like would make teams really think twice about what kind of like maneuverability they'd want but also it'd be just something that we haven't seen since like way back into like the corn days of the first year where you, it's just something completely weird to kind of drive over makes sense katie all right not in the same game but I want to see Return of the Tetras. I thought Tetras were really cool and they're like stacking and they're like giant but empty space. Um, I love teeter totters, either in the form of bridges or like 2018 style. So I would love to see more teeter totters. And then the last one is only because I really want to see how teams would solve the problem. I'd love to see footballs. Ooh. Yeah, I feel like footballs is like one that is in the same vein of like water game where people want to see it, but. Yeah. Like, I want to see a football game a lot. Yeah, with <laughs> like, somebody else competing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like, I want to see how they hard. index them and how they, like, because, like, I think when you load a football launcher, someone has to load it in a specific orientation. I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't know much about how football launchers work. Like, I want to see someone figure that out. I want to see that someone solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. I mean, that that might actually end up, Thinking, thinking of out loud here might help some of our like game piece indexing issues of now, right? Where you probably need something that's pretty compliant mm -hmm. instead of just rigid conveyors everywhere through your robot to get to a shoot or whatever. Like 
you know, some of that tech development that like might have actually helped if we had that before infinite recharge, where you have game pieces that are all sticky together and it basically sometimes act like footballs where they fold over each other and do kind of dumb stuff. So I, I would like to see that, yeah, just from a tech development standpoint, um, to see what people come up with. Um, okay, so it is 10 after nine and um, got one more final question here to kind of tie this all up. Um, and we'll start with Katie. What are you looking forward, ugh, words, what are you most looking forward to seeing come out of the game design challenge this year? Uh, I'm really excited to see like what wild concepts teams can come up with. The, the kind of concepts where I'm like, oh my God, that would have never occurred to me. Uh, I love when people break my brain. So like it would have been, I really hope to see some, you know, like out of the box, off the wall creativity. Makes sense, Peyton? Yeah, I, I'd agree. I think this is kind of meta, but I think it'd be interesting to see teams, because generally teams in, are good about liking games, but it's in, they always some form of complaint on certain aspects or, oh, this is this way. Why didn't they think of it this way? And now that teams themselves are coming up with the games, it'd be nice to see like an introspective looks like, oh man, this is a lot harder than I initially thought, or there's a million different ways that somebody could break my game that I never thought of breaking my own game. So I'd like to see like teams after the games have been kind of like reviewed, uh, see what it's like, oh man, I didn't think of that. And I came up with this thing kind of, kind of aspect. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I want to thank both of you for uh, coming on again for our live Q and A session. Um, you know, we stayed a little bit past time, but I think it's worth it. We had a bunch of really good questions. Um, and thank you all again for you know taking the time to do the recording and to you know spill your brains out of all the things we lived during this this time period here. Um, also, want to thank uh, you know uh, Brad Thompson for doing all of the stitching of making it all look good and being the master of uh, making us sound coherent. Um, and also to Matt Malinak for uh, directing this whole thing and kind of wrangling the cats and such to make this all be a thing. But um, as well, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back on, I believe, Wednesday, same time, same place, same Goof Channel, um, where we'll be talking about our next period of games. Um, very excited for that one. That's you know right in the middle of uh, kind of the big transition period for um, you know just out of like, these <laughs> games into kind of like what we view as modern, modern, new era FRC. It's going to be a really exciting episode. But on behalf of Liz, uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in, and we will see you next time. See y'all later. Bye.